Hey everybody, welcome. We're going to get started. I know it's after lunch, so I expect more people will join us. Um, but the clock's ticking and we have so much we want to talk about. So welcome to the future of media session, civil discourse in the social media age. My name is Manoush Zamarodi. I host a podcast from New York Public Radio called Note to Self. Every week we talk about how technology is changing the way we live, the way we work, the way we communicate. And um, after the recent presidential election in the US, we have certainly sharpened our focus on the effect of online platforms to be wonderful and absolutely horrible places to get your information, to share stories, and to be with other human beings. So today, our goal with this panel is to look into what responsibilities these platforms have, what the next chapter in digital literacy is, and what we can do to start getting social media platforms to do better at bringing communities together rather than uh, pushing us apart. So our three expert panelists have done research into this. They've also built um, places for people to get information, different ways of doing it. We're going to chat for a bit and then, of course, go to discussion and questions. Um, so it is my honor to introduce Phil Howard, who's sitting right here to my left. He's a professor of internet studies at the Oxford Internet Institute and a senior fellow at Balliol. He researches how digital media can be used for both civic engagement and political control around the world. Um, and he's been, been releasing some really fascinating uh, studies just over the last two weeks that we're going to get into. Um, and then Eli Pariser is right over there. He is the author of The Filter Bubble. Hard to believe this book came out five years ago. And now, I mean, we are just talking about everything that was in that book, echo chambers, Good stuff. Um, so Eli worked in community and political organi organizing, and in 2012 launched Upworthy, which is a news website that aim now this is how I described it, Eli. Tell me if I'm wrong. Aims to get people sharing empathetic stories about civic issues. Fair? Fair. OK, great. Fair. And then Matthew Siegel, to his left, is the founder of Attention. This is a news website aimed to make complex social issues palatable, easy to understand, easy to take action on for young people. Um, millions of millennials have shared site videos about gerrymandering, which I find <laughs> absolutely amazing. Um, and true. Matthew told me he's obsessed with making political ideas go viral online. Um, I know that this panel is called Civic Discussion, but we've all agreed that a civil conversation makes for a very boring panel. So <laughs> hopefully there will be some debate and maybe even an argument, um, but we'll all be friends afterward. Um, so there's this crazy statistic which said that in 2016, over 60% of Americans got their news through social networking sites. How many of you get your news through social networking sites? Just out of curiosity. Okay. More, definitely more than 60% in this room. Oh, and that just reminds me, I totally did not do what I was supposed to do, which was tell you to silence your phone and wait for the microphone before you speak and fill the session survey out. Okay, there you go. Um, so I want to start out by asking you, Eli, what are the pros and cons as you see it? Big question, and you just got off a plane, but I feel like that's good almost. You yeah. can wax lyrical on getting our most of our information on a social media platform? Um, so let me start with the cons, uh, okay. and then we'll, we'll move to the pros. So, um, you know, uh, the challenge with uh, social media websites, and I, 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 uh, let's just do a little taxonomy to start. When people say social media, there's sort of Facebook and there's everything else, and Facebook is several orders of magnitude larger in terms of the time people spend and the number of people on the platform than something like Twitter or Snapchat or whatever else. So um, I think you kind of have to separate out these phenomena. Facebook is, when, when people are saying they're getting news from social media websites, most of them are talking about Facebook. Um, and uh, you know the challenge is ultimately Facebook is a system that's optimizing for engagement. It's optimizing for people to spend time. And um, is relatively agnostic about how you're spending your time, um, but is looking for to show you content that you're going to engage with. Um, what that tends, what the algorithm tends to do is to show you things that it thinks you'll like, which is in part a service. Um, but it often means that uh, you end up seeing things that confirm what you already believe to be true. And that was kind of the core uh, idea behind the filter bubble is, you know, increasingly we have these algorithms. They're not really, at the end of the day, they're not serving us. They're serving the interests of these platforms. And the interests of the platforms are to 
drive advertiser eyeballs. So, um, so there isn't really an incentive for Facebook to show us stuff that is um, that makes us feel like doubtful or bad about ourselves or worried about you know. Outrage sells better than all of those. <clears throat> Outrage, love and hope, uh, you know, other strong emotions engage people, um, and and you lose something there. Um, I think the power of these. I mean, there's many powers of these uh, new media, but I think um, you know, two are they open up an opportunity for new voices to be heard. It's, it's not as if like the old media was so uh, inclusive or great at lifting up right. the voices of people across society. And actually, when you look at something like YouTube or you look at something like Facebook, on the one hand, you have um, you know, some really nasty people. But on the other hand, you have a lot of people who just like literally weren't allowed to speak right. who can now reach large audiences and tell their stories. And that's a potentially transformative thing. So we could say, you know, Bernie Sanders may not have existed as a candidate if we hadn't had social media because it made it easier to get to other people who may not have been taken seriously by mainstream media. Y yeah, Bernie Sanders for sure. But I was thinking even more of like, um, I met this woman recently who, uh, when she was like 15 in Iran, made this like rap video about ending child marriage, and it went viral. And um, she actually hadn't told her parents, and it was this whole thing to like explain to her parents that she had made a viral rap video about how they shouldn't sell her into marriage. Um, <laughs> but th that's the kind of person that I'm thinking of that just would not have had access to a million people ever um, in, an, in a you know, previous media system. It's a beautiful thing. So, Phil, you did a study that just came out which found that nearly a quarter of the web content shared on Twitter by users in the key state of Michigan in the days before the election um, was what you call in the report junk news. Mm -hmm. What's junk news and what did you find and why do you think it's significant? Well, we started that study because of something Zuckerberg actually said when he said that uh, only 1% of the content on Facebook was junk. And it occurred to us that um, the key issue isn't the, vol the amount overall, but it's concentration. Mm. And so if there was going to be an impact of, of fake news on voters, we thought we'd find it in Pennsylvania, Florida, Michigan. We took a close look at Michigan. And we found a one-to-one -one ratio. For every link to content produced by a professional journalist, there was at least one link to junk. And junk, we, it turned out to be very hard to operationalize fake news. Uh, as, a, as a concept, so we, met, we put together stuff that was sensationalist, extremist, uh -huh. commentary, masking as news, um, quite a range of things, and, and so that's how we got the one-to-one -one ratio. If you add in the amount of links to unverified WikiLeaks content and to Russia Today or Sputnik content, it's almost half of what Michigan voters were sharing was stuff not produced by professional journalists. Did, did that surprise you? I mean, what do you guys think when you hear that? Are you like, well, that's terrifying? Or yeah, of course. It, to me, it's terrifying. We did the same study on Germany around the, uh, around the same period of time. And there, the ratio is four to one. So four pieces of professionally n produced news content to one piece of junk. And my German collaborate, uh, collaborator says, that's awful. So they have it better in Germany, but they're still really concerned about what's happening to German public life and co political conversations. In the US, in an important swing state where things were 50-50, right? Yeah. right up into the last, uh, last day. Um, and I should also say that the proportion of professional news reached its lowest amount the day before the election. Mm -hmm. So the these lowest. proportions change over time. But the, but the proportion of professionally produced news con content was at its lowest just the day before everybody voted. Uh, Phil was telling me before we started that they got totally hacked after they put out this research, which I yeah. thought was So the website might be down at the <laughs> moment, but, <laughs> yeah. but um, I can send you a copy. <laughs> so so Matt, Matthew, over at Attention, are you finding that when you are presenting, um, if you're presenting a video about something that's controversial or a really important issue, what is your tack to get people to, when there's so many things playing to outrage and emotion, um, how do you go about it? Well, since we're talking about Facebook, you absolutely have to tap into people's emotions. <clears throat> 
outrage, love, empathy, uh, excitement, inspiration, those are all a lot of the emotions that people will share or put stories in front of their friends around. So when we're making a video, we often think, what is the most visceral way to first get people into an issue that otherwise might be boring? And I think a lot of times people conflate journalism with stories that are boring. Journalism doesn't have to be boring, but in the world we live in, you need to have a much quicker lead. You don't have time for slow play. So we think about what are the images, what are the words that can quickly pull people in, and then you can broaden and contextualize as the video progresses. But you often have to find some kind of emotion to pull people in with, uh, and then often we leave them with a call to action to share if they believe in the issue being spread that we're covering. So if they want people to know about redistricting or gerrymandering like you mentioned, we'll say at the end, share this video if you think more people should know about gerrymandering. And that um, really tells people to, if they care about an issue, uh, spread it to their friends. And I think that's an important part of how virality works today. I'm curious though, like there's this sense of, you know, fault lines that there's the, there's deeper trenches between us. Is it, should we blame social media for this? Or is it just, you know, helping nudge us in a direction that we were kind of headed in anyway? I mean, and I guess I'm referring to both the United States population, but also uh, Europe and you know, all kinds of places. I mean, I'll just say like automation, you can't resist social media. It's where things are going. So. To merely say we should not get our news from social media is rather, in my opinion, Luddite. Uh, and, and it doesn't make any sense. You have to adapt the product for social media. That said, you know, there's been a lot of talk. I was at a panel earlier today about fake news. You know, to a certain degree, you have to blame the electorate. <laughs> the electorate, you know, the burden is on the voter to look into the credibility of what they're reading from time to time. It, it, journalists themselves can't solve fake news. And Facebook itself, uh, which is a for-profit platform that's built on engagement, like Eli said, can't single-handedly solve fake news. Yes, they're starting to tag articles uh, with a red line that says, this has been disputed. But you know, the electorate themselves have to look into the veracity of what they read. And unfortunately, that burden does fall on people. So you know, it's the hard truth, but uh, no one entity can stop the spread of fake information. Eli, you agree with that? Um, I have many thoughts. Uh, the, I mean, so, so a couple things. First off, I think part of the reason that what you're doing, what we're trying to do at Upworthy, um, you know, part, of the, part of the premise for that is that the audience for news is much, much smaller than I think the folks in this room t typically would think. And there was a study uh, recently where they actually installed a browser plugin and watched just where people went around online. I think it was about 15,000 people. Um, any guesses on the percentage of people who visited more than one uh, hard news page in a three month period? Oh, God, don't make us Anyone? depressed. <laughs> 4%. Oh, God. So it's not as if uh, it's a habit that is um, evenly distributed across the electorate. That's like part one. Part two is, and I think this is a really uncomfortable thing to say in this conversation, and especially because we don't have someone, uh, I think, from the right to argue the other perspective. but. Um, there's a deeply, this is a deeply asymmetrical situation that we're in, in terms of the nature of media on both sides, the nature of the networks on both sides, and um, you can't, and so, uh, you know, the, and the consumption patterns on both sides. So what you see on the right um, is you have uh, a, bun a fairly small but extremely engaged group of people who are um, pretty much only sharing fairly far-right uh, information from Fox News and Breitbart and 
other places like that. Um, there's no analogous cluster on the left. Um, it's not that folks on the left don't share things that are left wing more, but um, there isn't that kind of epistemic closure uh, in the networks. It's not, it's not a closed system. Um, and so when we're talking about um, you know, fake news, um, Brendan Nyhan did this fascinating study where he looked at the consumption, same kind of design, like install a browser plugin and look at um, where people go. And he looked at where people, which people visit fact checking pages and which people visit fake news pages. And you see this sort of beautiful but somewhat dismaying curve, which is that the people who are most exposed to fake news in the last 12 months um, are, you know, uh, folks on the, uh, uh, you know, strongly right folks. Um, and the people who were least exposed were people on the, on the far, uh, on the left end of the spectrum. The people who visited fact-checking sites the most were the people on the left, and the least, the people on the right. So the, the consumption patterns, you know, I think one of the challenges we have is you have well-meaning progressives, um, and I include myself in that category, um, trying to design solutions the way that we think um, and not actually like grappling with the fact that there's a whole different epistemology happening you know, on, the, on the right. I mean, Phil, that's making me wonder. Um, you've been studying bot-generated Twitter traffic right. um, that was mostly pro-Trump. Mm -hmm. So does that sort of fill the vacuum in a way, is that, um, I mean, what role are they having in sort of political discourse well, right now? I, th I, think that, I think that they're having enough of a role that I'm not sure I would um, either blame the electorate or sort of leave it to differences in ideolog ideology. So we, we think that bots had a role in the US election in making Trump uh, 16 months ago seem more popular than he really was. Mm -hmm. Um, they made him seem like uh, somebody your neighbor might quietly vote for, even though they weren't telling pollsters that Trump was, that they'd vote for Trump. Um, we think the automation was behind his early popularity rise, and then we know the automation was behind the stories about Clinton in the last week. And so it's true that most, most people, most of the time, don't use social media for news, but they do during elections, mm -hmm. especially those last three, three days. In fact, Bill, did you link that to Russia? Sorry? Did you link that to Russia? Those no, bots we've Russia? given up on trying to geo work with the geotag data on bots. We're, we're still looking into the sourcing, but it's difficult to know where they came from. So you don't know where they originated? No, we don't know where they originated. We know that they appeared slightly <coughs> before the 2016 campaign season uh, began. Um, we know that they occasionally tweet things about Russian domestic politics that you wouldn't expect a large number of Trump voters to be keeping on tabs on. But, <laughs> but, but, but I don't have any data on, on, on that. So um, they made Trump seem more popular when he was largely a joke, right, compared to the other Republican contenders. And they made the stories about Hillary Clinton's corruption stay in our feeds even after the FBI said there was no, mm -hmm. there was nothing mm -hmm. to see here. So I think it's um, definitely the electorate is changing. Millennials get their news in very interesting different ways. But there is a very proximate cause here of misinformation, and that is Facebook. It, Facebook served misinformation to voters, also during the Brexit debates here in the UK. Facebook served bad news, misinformation, in the days before voters had to make a big decision. And so, I think there's, it, there's definitely the economics of news is changing. There's lots of big picture things. Higher education maybe isn't delivering critical thinking skills. There's lots of big picture things we could say. Um, but the proximate cause is that Facebook is the platform for bad info. I, I want to read you a, a quote. I know you, this is good. We're getting somewhere. OK, so News Corp CEO yesterday had an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. And he said, Google and Facebook have created a dysfunctional and socially destructive information ecosystem. Of course he'd say that. <laughs> yeah, he's one to talk. Yeah. Um. <laughs> Do you want to take that first? or Go for it. OK. Uh, so First of all, I think it's really easy to blame Facebook. I don't work for Facebook, but I'll, I'll uh, take the role as their defender here. Um, we did, by the way, invite them to take part it's in true, this. That's true, we did, oh. yeah. Um, I think that fake news has, already, has always existed. 
there's always been propaganda in newspapers. It's always been spread. Often, historically, it was spread through word of mouth. But the whole premise of Facebook is putting things that you agree with in front of your friends. So if anything, <clears throat> fake news is a projection of people's political identities on the right that they're sharing. And those people probably supported Donald Trump anyway. And did they really change a lot of hearts and minds if especially Eli's right and we live in these filter bubbles? Um, fake news can also be uh, spread through Google, through Wikipedia, through Twitter, through Snapchat, through Instagram. I mean, it's not just one platform to blame. Uh, but the fact is, the only way to really stop it, and I think Facebook is making some good efforts to tag articles when they're strongly disputed, um, is for voters and citizens to actually do the fact checking and uh, research the source that they're reading from. You know, if you're getting your news from a website called patriotnews.usa, it, it, you might want to think twice. Uh, and but, I, but there's a, but there's, that's, yeah. And, and uh, I think that there's too much blame on fake news for Donald Trump's win, in my opinion, uh, and not enough of a earnest empathy to understand where his voting base came from. Eli, where did and you I, And I think that's, that's actually why I frankly reject a lot of these premises. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, where to enter the, the um, so let's take the you know fake news in the election piece first. I think like uh, it, you know I kind of on the one hand like anything could have swayed this election. Media focus on Clinton emails, Comey's announcement two weeks before. Uh, you know, weather Russia. and the, uh, <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's, it's literally like, there's like, because it was a small margin, you can att attribute it to almost anything and be relatively right. Um, I think Trump's base, uh, and even the swing voters are older, uh, non-college educated men who are not your standard Twitter users at all and are not even especially your standard Facebook users, which skews female. Uh, so I think the premise that th that was kind of the primary factor, as opposed to like deeper struggles over national identity um, and race, I, I just sort of, I think when you zoom out and you look back, we're not gonna say this was about social media, we're gonna say this was about some much bigger things that were happening. but. What's interesting is, and I, I'm working on how to say this right, but, the, but it's not coincidental, I think, that you have um, this very big set of questions playing out about national identity. Um, at the same time that you have these mediums, which, as you said, are primarily vehicles for the expression of identity and the creation of identity. And those things inter interact and intersect in weird ways that we don't totally understand yet. But it's definitely the case that, um, you know, when, when people share things, um, it's not really for the purpose of informing, it's for the purpose primarily of shaping how you're viewed. And um, we've, the, the sort of crazy place that we've got, that we're getting ourselves into as a society is that you know, you have the primary form of media distribution, what's becoming the primary form of media distribution, um, not really based on, you know, any kind of sense of like, is this right? Uh, you know, but, but on a sense of just, is this fun or is it, does it say something about me? That's where more and more people are getting to it. So that's a problem because it's not even trying to align the question of, you know, what do people need to know with the question of what are they actually seeing. So, and it, it, it leaves people in, um, you know, I, I always think about that thing that people have on their Twitter, like retweets don't constitute endorsement. Like, that's kind of a problem if retweets are the way that people get their information. Like, who does have responsibility then for 
the distribution of information. So I don't want to like let the platforms off the hook. You know, Facebook is um, the biggest media company in the history of civilization, except it doesn't think it's a media company, and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but but also, as you're doesn't saying, doesn't admit it's a media company. Yeah, no, but but it is the biggest aggregator of human attention that we've ever seen. You know. And, so so yeah. to me, where the problem starts to be is when fake news turns into hate speech, essentially. Mm -hmm. Because I've, one of my new favorite terms is the Overton window. Do you guys yeah. know this term? Oh, I love it. It refers to what's OK to talk about in public without being considered inappropriate. So it's like it used to be completely wrong to be outright racist in America, and now or, or you know, at least it was on the DL, and now it's okay. And the more people say it's okay in certain pockets, the more people are emboldened for that to spread. And so, I, I mean, Eli, actually, you've called this a crisis of authority, which I find really interesting. Um, and you've been studying this as well because you're looking at the elections happening here in Europe, right. right? So, like, where does the fake news thing turn into a question of hate speech? And, of course, the, the law in Europe is very different when it comes to that than it is right. in the United States. It is. And political speech gets a lot of protections in the United States. And um, here in Europe, it, there tends to be a little bit more public policy, public oversight for political speech. And people are much more concerned about hate speech because this is a direct memory of um, uh, World War II. So I think, I think in Europe anyway, the instinct is not to leave it to voters or voter sophistication. And I think the policymakers I'm talking to uh, would agree that we're past the point that industry self-regulation is the solution here. Mm. The options that we're talking about, and I'm not making these up, these are what's on the table, are uh, 20,000 euros per post for a, each piece of fake news that's delivered to a voter as a fine, right, from the German government. A fine, uh -huh. yeah, 20,000 euros per post. Um, another option is algorithmic audits. Uh -huh. So we audit gambling machines, we audit finance trading algorithms. Facebook should be audited in a regular way that doesn't violate IP, intellectual property, but, but does let us understand what they're doing to our news diets. And then you know the other options are uh, studied and st continued study. And Facebook doesn't collaborate with researchers; right. they don't share data. Yeah. So in theory, they could actually tell us all this stuff um, and explain how bots might have had driven some news stories. Yeah. Um, but they haven't or won't yet. Yeah. Let me. Can I just underscore? Like, it is crazy that the that um, Facebook. Uh, with two point whatever billion users and you know uh, this huge aggregation of people's time um, is completely opaque to research. Like you literally can't begin to research what is going on in the world's largest forum for media distribution, and it's a it's an enormous problem mm -hmm. because and and partly because you know and and the research you're doing is is awesome. But you have all, all of the researchers are looking at Twitter saying like, well, hopefully this has some bearing on what's going on on Facebook. But we really have no idea. So I, I mean, I think someone has to take on figuring out how to ensure that Facebook opens up that data so that it can be studied. Because we've never had an institution that big that, that, that's that opaque. Can I jump in on the research? So yeah. what's interesting about this is that we do know that Facebook employs data scientists and yeah. does occasionally do research. Little tweaks to the system that they have demonstrated would bring hundreds of thousands of people out to vote. Right. Little experiments to see if they could increase the vote, and they can tell it works. They do little experiments, uh, emotional contagion studies, yeah. um, that demonstrate they, they could do much more. Um, but that's all in-house user experience stuff for a platform that is probably the source of our public life. At the yeah. Moment. Can we go back to the to the crisis of authority? Because I yeah. think like. So let me. So so I think the challenge in this conversation is. So so after the election, um, I was thinking about the fake news problem, and I um, started writing like a few ideas of how you just could design ways to downrank or filter uh, fake news. And I tweeted out a link to this Google Doc uh, that I was working in, and within hours there were like hundreds of people in it. 
Um, it is now uh, literally 160 pages or something um, with thousands of contributors, including a lot of Facebook engineers, Google engineers, uh, and other folks who are actively working on this. So, um, and I'll, I'll tweet it out afterwards. It's, it's, a, it's neat. I had almost nothing to do with it other than just happening to like tweet out the document, um, but people came together and collaborated. And what was interesting in the document and about the document is there was this tension between sort of journalistic folks who are essentially saying like, like uh, the filtering mechanism should be you have a White House press corps badge um, and that gets you some little special like uh, gold star next to your name in the Facebook algorithm and you go uh, up. Um, and, uh, and then you had uh, people who are looking for these decentralized solutions. And it, this conversation about fake news to me reads as a kind of proxy war um, between old media who doesn't want to let go of its authority and wants to find ways to instantiate that in the new platforms. And these new forms of authority that we're seeing, um, like the Google Doc itself, which was you know, thousands of anonymous contributors. I have no idea who they were, but they were contributing and, and collecting a lot of great ideas. And the Google and Facebook engineers wouldn't have been able to contribute if their name had, if they had had to credential themselves, right? So, where we are is this complicated place where I think the old systems of authority are problematic and didn't let people speak and were corrupt in some essential ways, the, the, the old media, by their advertisers, by their connections to folks in power. But we don't have like a, a way of thinking about what this new system of, of authority should, who should have authority, who should be trusted yeah. um, in this platform world. Okay, so... This is perfect. You guys are the best. 11 minutes till we go to Q&A. And like, to me, then, that says, OK, so whose responsibility is it? Let's switch, then, to what solutions you are finding. So Matthew, you're saying that like, it's up to normal people to figure out what's real, what's not real. How, how can you trust this source? So is that your job, then, as somebody making media to educate people? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's up to more than just people. I think although people certainly bear a significant portion of the responsibility to discern what's real and what's fake, in my opinion. Um, but how, how do they learn to do that, though? Well, I think we, that's where uh, credible media companies have to come in. You know, we have to, have to correct the record and myth bust things that are not true consistently, and that's a big part of our editorial each day. When we have editorial meetings, we often brainstorm what are the myths that are floating around on any issue being debated. Uh, issues around the budget, issues around social justice topics, issues around uh, war and peace. And then you take those misconceptions and you debunk them. And then once people say, wait, this is based in fact, evidence, research, original quotes, expert uh, testimonial, then they can deem you and categorize you as one of the credible outlets. And you know when your peers uh, also review you, no different than academia uh, as credible, then you have a reputation and then you maintain that reputation. Uh, so that's the way we look at spreading truth. But I also think some of the solutions are just to be a premium uh, editorial uh, outlet when you're programming on social uh, platforms and to really take your time and to uh, optimize your product for those platforms in a way uh, that's made especially for them so that people can see their, um, their news feed in a way that looks actually real as opposed to things that are just sort of pushed out through RSS. Okay, so how do we do that then? Because it's interesting to me, there are three, I think, financial models here on the stage, right? Sure. We've got the academic, are you B Corp? What? Yeah. Okay, so nonprofit. No, uh, for profit. But, but for profit, but with a. Social mission. Social mission. Okay, yeah. And then you're... We're also for-profit with a social mission. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that is Two. that how it has to work? I mean, because... Well, I think any good for-profit today should have a social mission. It's that simple. I mean, but that doesn't mean that you should not want to... <laughs> Speaking to the right apart. crowd for this <laughs> But I think, I, I, I think that said, uh, you have to monetize to stay in business. I mean, look, uh, Lori's <clears throat> here. I saw her speak... Um, earlier, and she can testify to how hard it is to raise philanthropic dollars for media. I think philanthropy and journalism is incredibly important, but I don't think it's going to necessarily save the entire industry. 
I think there's a hundred million dollars more apparently yeah. as of today, thanks uh, to mid year. But you know how much Bill O'Reilly makes in two years? His show makes for Fox News four hundred and sixty million, right? Yeah. So, and that's just one show on one cable channel. And and I think the idea that Facebook should <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 the point is, you have to monetize your your editorial in a way to sustain yourself, and you have to be entrepreneurial in, in how to go about that and appeal to brands who want to reach your consumer, but also not let the, the brands compromise your editorial. And that's been the truth for decades. That's, I, perhaps that's been the truth for decades, but not for the longer term. I think we often forget that this thing we call journalism started with public investment. Sure. It was public money that sustained and set the rules and, and allowed a culture of professional journalism to, to kick in. I just want to say, I think the, um, to me, the idea that Facebook should uh, turn to civil society groups to do fact-checking of content on Facebook is inane. Right. Um, I, I'm totally grateful. Uh, uh, the big money coming in from a Omidyar makes sense and is a sensible investment, but why should Omidyar be yeah. paying for fact check, supporting civil society mm -hmm. groups to do the to fact do checking for, for the Facebook. content that's yeah. on Facebook? Um, you know, of the things that could happen, Facebook could do some fact checking um, with it. <laughs> I mean, I happen to agree, and I think for, I find that with our show, a lot of um, teachers use it as a tool in the classroom because it is that fundamental that this is the next chapter in media literacy, and there are no resources out there to get kids to the point where they know whether something is reputable or true, or even how to find out or what it even looks like. And so, I mean, I think we have to go so many steps back to the very, very basics of what, what, is, what is a fact, period. Yeah. But I think you need media literacy like, for the media and for students, right? Because I think um, one of the challenges with public interest journalism is that uh, it has been able to presume an audience. Like it has, it, you know, if you write the best investigative piece at the New York Times, you get on the front page and you get seen even if um, it's not a super engaging piece. And that's going away. And that piece has to compete in a social news feed with like someone you know twerking and whatever other you know uh, distractions are happening, and and someone's update about their family, and um, we may not like that, but that is the place where this is all going down. And so I do think um, to to what you said, like there, you both need consumers and the audience and citizens to take and accept responsibility for their rebroadcast power um, and their creation power. And you need uh, to be talking about things that really matter in a way that works for that medium. And I think um, for Upworthy, you know, we look at two pieces of that. One is about um, using kind of emotional human storytelling to build empathy across groups. So how do you break down some of these uh, divisions? We, we know from research that one of the most powerful ways to break down stereotypes and implicit bias is simply to actually spend a little bit of time in someone else's world with who they really are. And when you look at, you know, we, we have some, a story about like uh, a video about a, a young Muslim woman who um, is teaching like a self-defense class. Um, and you can just see how the specific concrete facts of this woman's life run totally counter to kind of the underscored mythology around what it means to be mm. a Muslim. Um, it, it just breaks through all of that because she's a person and she, you, you root for her and you care about her. So I think that, that building empathy, um, you know, I think we think about sort of the purpose of the media a lot of the time in terms of information, um, but I think uh, if you look at the founders of the United States, they were equally concerned about kind of factionalism and rival tribes going at each other. And that doesn't happen through information. It happens through a shared sense of identity, a shared sense of purpose and belonging, and an understanding that other people's interests might be your own interests in some bigger way. And so how do you, so I think these media can be really extraordinary tools for telling those kinds of stories and actually building a sense of um, you know, cross-group uh, understanding. Okay, so 
we're going to go to questions. I have one more. So have your question ready. I think there's a microphone floating around. And if you want to get it ready, we'll go there while that gets started. I'm just going to ask one final question from my perspective. Like, you know, you wake up this morning and everybody knows about what happened in Syria and it's horrible. And how do we then, it's great. We're all, we all know. But then I think a lot of people in this room would like to know, but then how do you get people to take that empathy that you're talking about or the knowledge that they have and then actually be invested and do something and, and make change? Well, one of the powerful parts of social media uh, for some of the bad press it's getting is that you can immediately and rapidly start campaigns to raise money. We just covered a campaign around um, the famine and hunger in Somalia um, that was actually started by a social media, I, I guess you could call he was originally a viner. He had a big vine following. His name is Jerome Jure. And he raised two and a half million dollars by tweeting at Turkish Airlines, which had the only direct flight to Somalia mm -hmm. to ship cargoes of food uh, a few weeks ago. And it was an incredibly powerful campaign. He started it. Uh, he created a hashtag. He got a bunch of individuals and celebrities to retweet it. Next thing you know, Turkish Airlines signs on board and two and a half million dollars is donated through a GoFundMe campaign. That could not have happened as quickly, certainly as quickly, and probably as easily uh, 15, 20 years ago. It, it would have needed you know, the uh, ad council to do a whole campaign on television networks and that is a huge bureaucracy. Uh, and so social media has cut down that kind of bureaucracy to do social activism. And you've seen it with Syria, you've seen it with Somalia, you've seen it with disaster relief in the United States. I, I totally agree with that. And I, I think um, one of the most powerful disinhibitors to both action, but actually engagement with these kinds of stories is despair and a feeling of hopelessness. And I think people actually rationally look at a serious story and say, I am not going to spend emotional time and energy on that because there's nothing I can do. Like, like if that's what they believe, that there's nothing to be done, then they look away. And there's, there's a, a, some fascinating research about this, uh, about sort of um, almost like uh, empathic withdrawal um, when we see things that we despair about. Um, and I think, frankly, like, and I say this as an advocate, as a former advocate at Move On and, and as someone who cares a lot about all of these movements, I think um, people, people often feel despair and hopeless when they think about these things. And so with Upworthy, you know, sometimes uh, people say like, uh, uh, so like you're being Pollyannish or it's all this hopey, changey stuff. And, uh, How's and that going? I, 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 I deeply believe in it. You have to have hope. You have to believe that change is possible or you'll never make change. And so if you can give that to people in little bursts and show them how they can actually participate in these things and yeah. show them that there are solutions, like th that is the beginning of actually making change. And cover positive news. You know, we cover good news occasionally. Exactly. You know, there are good things happening in the world, uh, and we <laughs> go out of our way to amplify them. And by the way, they're some of the most shared articles or videos we make. Great. Well, let's go to questions. Um, we have someone right here. I think the... There's two microphones right here in the front. She's coming. Yeah, you have to wait, otherwise I get in trouble. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, Julia Davis with Datakind. Um, so I'm curious, uh, we just put out an open call for projects to do predictive technology on issues in journalism, uh, combating fake news, uh, combating hate speech online. What do you think, you know, we hear a lot about the bad bots and all the things that automation is going to do to ruin the world. What do you think are really ripe opportunities for predictive technology to actually um, make the world better in this particular context? So um, this is a great question because there's, we should talk about the good bots, the ones yes. that make corrections on Wikipedia, right? Whenever a politician tries to edit their own page. Um, there's some great, <laughs> some great examples of um, computational journalism, right? People, journalists doing creative work with big data sets to break new stories. 
Um, and I think the, um, so one of the things we're going to work on next is the use of machine learning to generate the content for manipulating public opinion. Um, that's the dark side of what perhaps you're describing uh, using machine learning algorithms or basic AI to um, get good information on human rights abuses, to manage the drones that deliver supplies in the case of a crisis. So, and in my experience, I just want to echo what my um, co-panelists have said, that I, I think that activists, democracy advocates, are always more creative and more desperate than dictators. <laughs> I think we're at a... a <laughs> I think we're at a sensitive moment where the dictators have learned, or political yeah. elites have learned some of the tricks, and this cycle of innovation now sort of falls back on us as civil society actors to um, get creative again, start to work with the Internet of Things, um, watch the privacy regulations, and you know participate in information policy making, because that's the one domain of policy making that will affect all the others, right, or ruin all the others. I'll also just say, I mean, I, I think. Uh, if you've been following Facebook closely, um, you know, in the last few years, like, they're very tuned into what works outside of Facebook and copying Snapchat features left and right. Um, I think there's, that's an entrepreneurial opportunity for the kind of people who are working in this space on the public interest side, too. Like, I, I see no reason why um, we shouldn't see adoption by these platforms of new uh, methods and ways of doing things that are pioneered and described outside. And on the one hand, that may be an intellectual property problem. Uh, but on the other hand, I think like um, with Facebook, I mean, it, it, you can't underscore the degree to which, you know, it's sort of like, um, you know, someone woke up and found themselves like president of a small country that they didn't want to be or expect to be. like. They own the media, and that wasn't even their thing. And so I think a lot of what you see is just like coming to grips with an immense amount of power that they're not, they need ideas. <laughs> and I think these ideas can come from folks in this audience yeah. um, and could be really powerful there. Yeah. I'd love to give a small case study, if I may, which was um, we did with our listeners, 30,000 of them, speaking of good bots, um, we decided to do a week where you were your own filter um, and see what sort of focus you could, what you could achieve if you decided to filter the news or whatever. We had you set an information mm. goal. And then for a week, we had bots tweet you to check how you were doing to keep you sort of on track and to measure how well you did. Um, the project had a really silly name. It was called InfoMagical. But the results were really quite extraordinary. And one of those times, um, the bot would send you, you know, do you want to talk to Manoush? And if you texted back yes, your phone would ring. And it was me saying, hey, it's Manoush. You can leave me a message. And I got 2,500 voicemails that day. I listened to almost all of them. And so I think there is this sense, like the individual, wow. I really did. This, because people are so generous, and they yeah. tell you so many amazing things. And I had got, this was like a way to, be in these people's lives in one day and telling me what, what mattered to them and what they had taken in and how it had changed their life. And I think this idea of going back and forth with stories as well is incredibly powerful. And they were so upset when the week was over because they were like, but I need you. I need you to keep me on track because otherwise, like, I'm looking at couches on Pinterest for hours and hours, you know? <laughs> so I think there's these, there's, there's really small things we can do, too, that can make a very big difference. And I, for me, especially with younger people who I think are not, are not learning self-regulation when it comes to a lot of this stuff, and there's an opportunity there. I don't know if anybody else wants to. Um, is there another question right here in the front? Right here. I have a. Oh, sorry. Wait, we've got a mic here. Can we run the mic up there for the next one? Oh, you have a mic. Dueling microphones. Okay, back, go. Okay, uh, Deborah Dunn from Stanford University. So there have been several studies, and in my jet lag state, I'm not gonna remember <laughs> what We're the sources you. are, but I don't think it's fake news, um, saying that because so many people are consuming their news online, it's radically changing the way people read news and consume news and leading to a more superficial level of looking at news, just looking at headlines, et cetera. And you, this isn't something that you commented on, but it clearly changes 
the ability that people have to have a substantive discourse around things as opposed to just battling over the headlines. So I'm curious about whether in your work you see this as one of the significant issues that needs to be addressed or not so much. Matthew, do you want to take that one? I mean, the fact sure. that your company is called Attention, yeah. I think is kind of perfect. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> sure. Well, I mean, I, I haven't seen that study. I'm sure there's uh, some truth to it. But candidly, when I read a hard newspaper, I still scroll through and read the articles where the headlines interest me. So I, I, I think, you know, in the old model, there's still a natural filtering that happens and headline competition. And editors have always tried to come up with punchy, uh, at times horrible pun-like headlines uh, that you see. But um, I do think there's more competition just because, like Eli said, you're competing with family photos and Miley Cyrus twerking. Uh, so you have to be really clever uh, and attention grabbing with how you appeal to people. And uh, we have conducted some research as to what types of headlines work uh, and also what types of images work. And I think uh, you have to tell people what they're going to get. You have to promise them that they're going to get some kind of important information, some kind of emotion, uh, or some kind of necessary scoop so that they can be in the know. And uh, that's what we focus on. We, we try to market our story accurately to say what's actually in it, um, but uh, bring people to it in a way where we're giving them some kind of gratification after they're finished consuming it. Did you want to say that, Ethan? Mm -hmm. I also, I also think, um, well, so, so two pieces. One is David Carr uh, at the New York Times used to tell the story about being at an alternative weekly, and all of the reporters would like fight over who got to have the cover story. And when the newspaper went online, they realized that actually nobody reads the cover story, and everyone only reads like the astrology column in the back. <laughs> um, and so I think there's a way in which I think that's partly what's going on here, is we're just seeing with data what was already true, which is that uh, people don't engage as much as they, as you would hope. I think the other piece, though, is like, um, so the power of stories is that they build schemas. They build like mental scaffolding for how to think about an issue and the concepts around an issue. And um, one of the challenges in this area, like, like if you want people to engage deeply, then you have to build this kind of fluency with the area and you have to build the schemas from the bottom up or it's just gonna seem, it's just gonna be too, too hard going. Um, and so I actually think uh, there's, you know, starting uh, with something that is a fairly simple emotional resonant schema and gives you a foothold to then build complexity around. Whereas if you go directly to complexity, um, I think it's often very challenging. Like imagine when, when you're thinking about foreign journalism, when you know the characters in a country and you know who they are and what they're doing with each other, then it's interesting to read about. But the first time you drop into you know, what's going on in the politics of, of the Congo, like it, without that background, it's very hard to see what is happening and what the story even is. So I, so I just think building those building blocks, those schema are a really important piece of, of the of the process. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Just to be clear, the suggestion of the study was not just about you have to compete to get people to read the story, but that not many people are actually reading stories, period. Huh. That <laughs> when they look at the data, a lot I of can people speak are just to that. stopping at headlines. So um, one researcher who's doing amazing work is Marianne Wolf at Tufts University, and she's looking a lot at the neuroscience behind deep reading versus skimming, and this idea that it is indeed a muscle that, like, you know, if you don't use your deep reading skills, they they do indeed go away. She did this own experiment on herself, like she tried to sit down and read her favorite book, which was *The Glass Bead* by Herman Hesse, and like could not get through it. And so she sort of powered through, and um, and it took her two weeks to be able to actually sit down and read. A book. I mean, I certainly see that in myself, that when I try to sit down and read a book, it is really hard if I don't stick to it. So which her indication is, is that actually that's another type of 
um, skill that needs to be taught to younger people, that there's the deep reading skills versus the skimming skills, and that you need to have both. I mean, even if you don't want to read some diatribe about a certain Kurdish faction, you are going to need to read insurance papers or, you know, when you buy property, like you have to be able to do, sit and do this deep reading. So I think that it's, there's an interdisciplinary sort of interesting approach to how we take in uh, information as well. And I think um, the head of the Institute for the Future was talking about that this morning, this neuroscientific look at what it means to um, present information and news. Yeah. I think the, I, I think this, the, the findings sound right to me. And I, I also think that this is the moment where we can start to experiment a little bit, not just with how news consumption happens, but how Facebook is integrated in public life. Um, the exit polling system in most democracies is broken. It hasn't worked in the United States in 10 years. It hasn't worked in, in the UK for five, at least. Could Facebook have helped us do some kind of exit polling system? There's a lot of exciting experimental uh, deliberative polling, deliberative democracy exercises that let people who actually are interested in an issue spend time thinking about something that could generate a voter's guide or could generate a public policy recommendation. And social media is probably going to be the best hope for those supporting those kinds of institutional innovations. I would just say, as a, by way of a kind of counterfactual, what country in the world will ever hold another referendum? <laughs> what, gov what government will ever run another referendum? I would say referenda are not likely to be popular mo modes of governance. But um, for the next few years, but uh, experimenting with social media could get the people who are interested in those news stories to, to generate trustworthy you know, findings, outcomes for the rest of us. To, to the good book problem, I think this is actually a thing that the, it feels like a problem that would be hard for platforms to solve. But I actually think there are, it's an interestingly solvable problem in a certain way, which is, what personalization generally focuses on is sort of prospective interest. Like, am I clicking on the headline? Am I viewing this video now? What it doesn't focus on is a month later, two months later, like, did it leave me with anything? Mm. Do I care? And when you think back to your like peak media experiences, the places where you consume something that really changed your life or changed how you thought about something that you loved and that you would want anyone else to have, that set of content looks really different from the set of content that you're served if it's just about what you're clicking right now. That's a measurable thing. Like you could go back to people and say, okay, here's uh, 20 things you saw in your Facebook feed. Put a star by the ones that now a month later you care about or you were glad you saw or you, you know, that, that built some kind of value for you. Um, and I think that, that could be a powerful intervention. Um, like, like part of what we're dealing with here is a, is a war between kind of our impulsive selves and our aspirational selves. And our aspirational selves like, could use a little help. Because like, it's, it's not like it's fake. It's not like, like what, the, what some of the data scientists would say is like, oh yeah, people say that they you know, want to watch Kurosawa movies, but actually like, it's all you know, uh, Dawn of the Waking Dead 4 or whatever. Um, <laughs> You know, but that's not really true because in our lives, like it was powerful to read that Herman Hesse book. Like it, it did matter, <laughs> and actually mattered a lot more than like the 19 cell phone reviews that I read. Even though I'm never going to have anything but an iPhone, like so. <laughs> that is true. I mean, I think like there's interesting startups like Pocket. Do you guys use Pocket, yeah. which yeah. is an app that saves your stuff? I try to save. Um, I saved. Because it made me so happy, it's so stupid. But um, remember when they named that boat Bodie McBoat Face, yeah. but whatever. Yes. I don't know why that made me so happy. So I stuck it in my pocket along with like this really long, deep article from the New Yorker that I really must read. And actually, then I read it, and it was amazing. But they're next to each other, Bodie McBoat Face and the long New Yorker article. And, and but I'm trying to I'm trying to make space for the things that really have moved me. And I think startups like Pocket like can be helpful with that. Your question. Hi, my name is Megan Stone. I um, spent the last three years working with Malala Yousafzai, but right now I'm at Harvard at the Kennedy School with Zach Exley, actually, at oh, the really? Shorenstein Center. I'm looking at the intersection between social media and the Muslim ban. 
uh, policy in the United States and working with MIT and the Media Lab on it. But my question is, um, there's a lot of hand-wringing at Harvard and here and everywhere about Russian bots and about what happened. And I'm wondering if you have any advice to people who are actively organizing resistance efforts in the United States and otherwise, like how to use these tools better. Um, I had two friends who started a group called Indivisible. They stumbled into it. They had an open source Google Doc, and now this has become 5,800 yeah. groups. So as much as we see Russian bots, we see 5,800 independently organized chapters of Americans you know, pushing back on the Trump agenda with no resources and no real apparatus. So what kind of advice would you give to these groups that are organizing now, knowing what you know about how to do that well today? So um, I'll give like a tactical answer and a bigger answer. Um, Tactically, <coughs> I think you can't underestimate the power of simply explaining to people something that plausibly seems like it will actually make a difference. And this is the sort of like, let's, let's, treat our, let's treat people who can potentially be engaged as like somewhat rational adults who are looking at your petition or, or whatever, my petition, and saying like, that just doesn't, it seems like bullshit. It's not gonna do anything. Um, what was powerful about Indivisible was that you read that manual and you go, oh yeah, this is actually, this makes sense, it's doable, I could do that. And th that's, I, I truly believe that people are not apathetic, they're just like trying to figure out like, where can I put my energy and actually get something mm -hmm. to change? And so I think anywhere that you can show that theory of change in a really clear, crystalline way, you often find that people are, really willing to do it. If you can tie that to an emotional story, which is what we had with the Muslim ban, um, and, in, and even more particularly to individual people's stories, then it's even more powerful. And I think part of the power of Black Lives Matter was rooted in the stories of these individuals that you, whose, whose lives you get to know um, and whose deaths you get to know that combined with a, with a theory of change that makes sense, that's very powerful. The broader thing I would say is, um, you know, one of the most powerful human needs and forces is the need to belong. And um, I think that's what's animating actually a lot of the bad stuff out there as well as the good stuff. And I think building movements and organizations and media companies that give people a sense of belonging to something and having an identity that they're proud of um, is just an incredibly important piece of uh, how we get out of this mess. Another positive thing of Facebook, by the way, is the events. I mean, after the travel ban, people were basically planning a uh, Saturday or Sunday protest at pretty much every major airport across the country. Yeah. Those weren't organized by some major Washington, D.C. nonprofit that has a national arm that used its local affiliates. Those were organized by random organizer in LA, random organizer in Seattle. And then they grew to having 8,000, 12,000, 15,000 RSVPs to the point where people actually showed up. And the Women's March actually started as a Facebook group. I interviewed the, one of the co-founders of the Women's March, co-organizers, and she said, after, uh, you know, while the, while the campaign was happening, we created this Facebook group, and all of a sudden, 250,000 people RSVP. So, I mean, another positive benefit of Facebook, even though it does have its uh, negative externalities, as I think, think they'd say in academia, uh, <laughs> is uh, uh, that you can organize events and quickly get people together in a really powerful and impactful way. Phil, do you mind just commenting though this idea of um, building good bot bots to combat bad bots? Like, is that a viable tactic? I think um, so. We once ran this experiment where we tried to get um, we tried to write bots that would convince somebody who either thought the Earth was flat, that you shouldn't inoculate your kids, or that you were that white supremacy was the way to go. We, we tried to write bots to to change their minds about things. And we had links to science, and we had links to policy papers, and things like that. And um, we had to stop this, I know it sounds funny, links to policy papers. Um, <laughs> we had to stop because our bots got locked into a debate with the bots. <gasps> no! Uh, the the anti-inoculation community ha had their bots, and their bots found our bots, and our research was founded by the National Science Foundation, so that was a problem, too. Whoa. Uh, so 
I would say, um, you know, I want to say, no, don't do it. But uh, on the other hand, the people who are arguing the other side of the issue are doing it. And even if we don't, even if we stop talking about Trump, I, I think Trump and Brexit were mistakes based on misinformed public opinion. But let's put those aside. There are other issues to do with what I think of as facts and science, like climate change or uh, the link between smoking and cancer. Some things that we've hold as, held as true for a long time that are starting to whittle away mm. because of some very successful automated social media campaigns that get people to think, well, it's not every form of cancer, it's just, just some of the cancers and the link isn't quite clear and climate change is, do we really know? And so um, these, and these, have been, these are driven by issue-specific lobby groups who want to take down green technology or want to put up um, coal, clean coal. Well, there's a range of issues um, that have their bots behind them. So I guess I would say um, you need a bot strategy of some kind. Are, are arguments between people more or less civil than arguments between bots? Between bots. <laughs> That's a good question. And what came first? <laughs> yeah, first yeah. Uh, Anne-Marie, right here in the front. Anne-Marie Slaughter, uh, President and CEO of New America. So I, I want to underline one thing I'm taking away from this panel and, and then ask a question. The, this idea of the tension between our, in, our impulsive and aspirational selves is very important. I mean, if, even if you look, I look at my son trying <laughs> to block social media when he's working, and there are various apps you can get that, uh, that, wor that work. But I think about, you know, what if you had a news bit? You know, my Fitbit means I walk 10,000, 12,000, 13,000 steps. If you do something like that to get news from a wider range, uh, it seems to me that that would be quite helpful. The question I want to ask, civil discourse mm. in the social media age. So I use my Twitter feed as an experiment routinely, and when people tell me horrible things, I go back to them and I say, really? I mean, what's the point of calling me that name? Uh, or Do you always do that? I often do. Wow. It's just my, it's my little forum for trying to improve civil discourse. And all, what surprises me is about half the time I get an apology very quickly. They didn't really think mm -hmm. there was somebody on the other side. They were just venting. Uh, but they really use horrible language, really a repulsive language. But I call them out. And so my question is, you know, when we talk about you know, creating tribes and belongings, the biggest problem I see is we're demonizing people on the other side. They're not just different from us, they're evil. And the left does that to the right, as the right does that to the left. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on how, you, how we really, I mean, it, we don't have hate speech, speech laws in the US, but that's not it anyway. It's just basic civility. Like, didn't you have parents? Didn't you, <laughs> you know, like, some kind of shocking people back into a very basic norm of civil discourse? One of my favorite pieces of research uh, about this, um, it was looking at where there is civil discourse online. And, um, Fascinatingly, uh, one of the places that you can find it is on like sports forums, and um, and when you think about it, it kind of makes sense because um, there is a tribal identity of being for the Patriots or the Red Sox or whatever. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, see, we're we're bonded now, uh, and we can disagree, um, but. It really, it's like that, you know, that, that if you prime a different identity um, and that's the central identity, then you can have a good conversation about really hard things underneath it. And I think finding spaces and ways to prime identities other than partisan ones mm -hmm. is a key piece of how you build those connections. My other favorite study on this front is about um, basically like they, they took a football stadium, another sports thing, um, and uh, basically took people whose team had just won and people whose team had just lost and asked them both about uh, points of view that they considered uh, you know, uh, a threat to them in some way um, and, and groups of people, um, like implicit bias. And the group that had just won um, was much more open to different points of view and open to different kinds of people than the group that had just lost. Um, because when people feel like their identity is threatened, they cling to the things that are 
give them that kind of sense of identity. So what that suggests is uh, affirming one dimension of people's identity gives you, a, gives you space to create disagreement mm -hmm. that's not gonna be, that people aren't gonna freak out and go like, I've gotta win because my whole being is at stake. Mm. I love that. Do you guys have anything else to add with that? It's tough. <laughs> I know it. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think uh, and one of the things I did after the election was I started following a bunch of news sites that I disagreed with, generally speaking, because I wanted to understand uh, filter bubbles. I wanted to understand where the other side was coming from. But then I also think part of it is covering issues that reach across the partisan uh, divide. One of the issues that uh, attention covers regularly and proudly is marijuana reform. And that is a great uniter of libertarian <laughs> conservatives, social justice liberals, and increasingly so, old people who need it for medicinal reasons. And so we'll post on that topic, and we'll see the strangest bedfellows come together. <laughs> so I think it's really important to, to cover issues you know, uh, that will bring people together as part of your editorial programming strategy. That's probably the best answer I can give you. But forcing trolls not to be trolls. I mean, when people have the luxury of anonymity, of course they're going to say terrible things. And I think that's predated Facebook. I think it's predated Twitter. So uh, forcing people to come out of anonymity will make it more intimidating for them to use foul language or harassment or hate speech. Uh, and some sites make you create a public identity. It's actually, the, the problem of trolling is uh, not as bad on Facebook because there are fewer fake accounts than on Twitter. Uh, trolling is much worse on Twitter because it's much easier to create an account and it's a lot less curated and therefore uh, people create these bots or these fake identities where they can basically just be jerks all day. Dogs, another good one. Yeah. I've heard the Facebook, like somebody I know at, um, at BuzzFeed, she's really into the dog Facebook group in her neighborhood because she's like, there's no talk about politics. All we're doing is talking about dogs. And she feels really connected to her neighborhood. <laughs> Makes sense, actually. I think we have time for one more question. Anybody else right here in the middle? <clears throat> yeah, hang on one sec. Um, it's Judy Boone from the Aspen Institute. Um, we had this conversation this morning, too, and I just want to tap you guys insights into truth um, because I always thought that the tenet of a good journalist was to be objective and share the facts but I'm finding that that's not necessarily true anymore I and even this morning on the panel one of the panelists was talking about her liberal media site which is a fabulous site if you're liberal but if you're not they're not gonna you're not gonna go so the question I have is how do you, in this era of breaking down into fractionalized media sites, and we only have so much time, because we all work, at least in this room, I'm assuming, <laughs> and I don't have time to look up all the facts. I don't want to have to look up the facts. I take issue, Matthew, with what you said. I don't have time to do that. I'm depending on you as an objective, reasonable journalist to tell the truth. And I just want to know where you guys come out on that, because that, that, I think, is where we start building trust if people begin to understand that what the media is saying is true. Well, first of all, to clarify, I was saying you have to vet the sources uh, that you're consuming news from. I think you need to look at where you're consuming from and say, is this place credible? I'm not saying that it's your responsibility to fact check every journalist you read. Of course not. If you're reading from a reputable, trusted outlet, of course you should take the journalist at his or her word. Uh, but I, I think I, I like to define the role of good journalism as fairness, not objectivity. I think there's such thing as false objectivity. And the climate change example is the best uh, uh, reason for that. There's no reason to have a climate denier on with someone who believes in climate change when the clear data evidence and facts show that climate change is real, exists, and it's existentially threatening humanity. Uh, there is a need to be fair. And what we try to do at Attention is to be fair and give a fair hearing and argument uh, to what we're covering. And fairness means that you don't use straw men arguments. You don't uh, lampoon the other side.
But uh, if 98% of data proves one thing, you don't have to create some false objectivity that the other 2% somehow has 48% more weight. And I think that's where cable news has gone awry. So we like to view our job as being fair. Uh, that might coincide with being objective. But I think when you're fair, people respect you. And we've even had readers say, uh, you know, I, I don't agree with, for instance, taking marijuana. I don't agree with marijuana legalization, but you present the, the data fairly. And, uh, but I disagree with it because I still think, from my own personal experience, it's a gateway drug. And we're never going to disprove that person, but we still put out the fair evidence that it's not a gateway drug based on the numerous clinical studies that have shown it's not. In fact, it's an anti-gateway drug for opioid addiction. So the point is, you have to be fair, but being objective, I think, is kind of a word they should no longer necessarily um, hitch their wagon to as, as steadfast in journalism. So a thought experiment. Um, you have two people. One person is cold and narcissistic, self-interested, but factually accurate. And the other person is warm, cares about you, has your back, but less factual accurate less factually accurate. Which one of those people do you trust? I think on a human level, trust is about who is on your side and has your back. And I think this is one of like the big gaps between how journalists think about trust and how trust actually works between people is that um, you don't trust people based on factual accuracy. You trust people based on a sense of um, you, you have my best interests at heart. And I think um, people rightly feel like a lot of uh, media and a lot of journalists don't actually care about them and have their backs. And um, there was a wonderful study by the main, uh, the Portland Press Herald, um, looking at uh, where their coverage was relative to uh, the vote. And they found that, um, you know, counties in Maine and cities in Maine where uh, the Trump vote was highest, they had done the fewest stories, right? They really didn't care about the stories of those places and those towns, and it showed up. And so I really believe that if you want to build that trust, like, trust is a necessary precondition for facts. It doesn't go facts, then trust. It goes trust, then facts. And if you want to build that trust, you have to actually demonstrate to people that you care about them in a real way and that you have their backs in a real way. And that's the work that we have to do, and we, yeah. we have to well, do that, that too. Sides do it. Yeah, um, but, but I think that's the way that you kind of break through in this. You wanna have the last word, yeah, Phil? This one's tough, because I, I do believe in truths, and I think that there are some truths that need to be communicated to the public, and we as a sort of panel made a, there were a couple of jokes earlier. We started off with a couple of jokes about whether Facebook was a media company or not, or whether they were telling themselves they were a media company or not, and I think it's, um, I think they are, and that, that whether, that there are truths, but that the public believes things based on many different kinds of info they get from their friends, their family, the bus ads, and what they see on social media. <coughs> and so anything we can do to inject or protect some truths in social media feeds will only improve public life. And I don't have a laundry list of which truths should, should get through. Um, we know Facebook employees uh, about two, two years ago suddenly got excited, upset about payday loans. And they did something about the advertising on payday loans that wiped the, this issue, this mm. economic inequality issue, off the social networks. There are a few other issues like that that are public policy issues that have truths about them that Facebook could push to feeds. And I think we're past the point where we can just leave it to social networks to sort of self-police. Yeah. See you next year, right? Um, <laughs> thank you so much, panelists. Thank and you. I leave you with one thing. Sorry. Go out. Do one thing after you leave here. Go have one civil conversation about something really hard. Because I think that's part of it, too, is we need to be brave in the face of all of this. So thank you so much for having us. Well done. Well done.